Come, man. Ask him. Not you ask him. I don't want to bug him. Look at him. He's in the zone. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. It's like deep compassion and then boom, authority. I just, I wish I could do that. Well, he said anything that he can do, we can do too. Yeah. You know, that's true. Jesus? Yep. Hey, sorry. I know you're like focused, but. What's up? Well, some of us disciples were wondering if you could, you know. Teach us to pray. This is a really interesting question, actually, coming from a group of Hebrew boys who would have grown up in synagogue. Like, you know, in, in Jewish culture, life revolves around their faith. And so, you know, these guys knew how to pray. They'd been taught how to pray. They'd prayed their whole lives. They prayed before they could walk. They prayed before they, before they could talk, they prayed. Like they, they would have prayed their whole life. Yet, in the life of Jesus, they saw something that caused them to say, you're doing something we're not doing. And you're getting results that we don't get. And what happens when you pray is really different than what happens when we pray so could you maybe fill us in on how to do this? And uh, the, today's message is called Street Level Prayer. And, uh, you know, lots of us have a very religious view of prayer. Yes, we, you know, you get in a group of people, and you can just see it. You know, when we have our pre-service prayer, if you get in a group of maybe five or six people, there's always a couple people who... They get real scared because it's like, I don't want to pray out loud. I don't, and, which is okay, but prayer shouldn't actually be intimidating. Prayer is something that should be as natural as conversing with someone with, over a cup of coffee. And so this is the, this is the kind of prayer that, that these guys, they saw in the life of Jesus so they came to him and they, 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 asked, they asked Jesus, teach us how to pray. And so this is what he teaches him in Matthew chapter 6. It says, when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. I love that. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corner of the streets. Then they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees, you in, or who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. <laughs> how, do you, how many of you know somebody like that? It's just, <laughs> they will be heard because of their many words. Jesus goes on to say, Therefore, do not be like them. For your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask him. It's really interesting. I find that he prefaces this whole thing as you don't need to say a lot because he's got a better handle on your situation than you do. He knows what you need more than you know what you need. Sometimes when you ask for things, his answer is no. Same reason that you say no to your kids when they ask for chocolate bars for dinner. Can I have chocolate bars for dinner? No. no. <laughs> Aww. Vain repetitions don't help, do they? <laughs> You're, the answer's still no. Therefore, he says, in this manner, therefore, pray. In this manner. And then he goes on to give us the prayer that we've all learned our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And most of us know to say, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Which is actually not in the original manuscripts of the Bible, but was added later. But... It still is a great little catchphrase at the end. <laughs> However, we have completely missed the point of this prayer. <laughs> 
We call this what? Yeah, well, guess who? It's not his. It's not. It's the disciples' prayer. It's the prayer they said, teach us to pray, so he taught them. It's not the Lord's prayer. Jesus didn't pray that. He gave it to his disciples to pray. But that's not even the point. <laughs> What's really interesting is, is he prefaces this instructions to pray with the preface of don't use vain repetitions that you'll think you'll hear from your many words. And then we proceed to turn this into a prayer, which is the vain repetition that we all said before school, and many of us have grown up vainly repeating through our lifetime. Isn't it true? Sorry if that offends you. Sorry, not sorry. Jesus started this off by saying, don't use vain repetition. Yeah. He started the whole thing off with, don't think that God's going to hear you just because you blabber. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know what? This wasn't, this wasn't a prayer to pray. This was like bullet points. On how to pray. This was, this was like the general outline. You can fill in the information as required. You know, because it's different for everybody. Everybody's in a different situation. And so, then he says, in this manner. In other words, not this prayer, but in this manner. Here's your, here's your guide. Here's your outline. In this manner. Follow this pattern. And uh, what's funny, when, when he gives the instruction, they ask him, how... Teach us how to pray. Well, the first thing he tells them to do is what not to do. And then he, you know, he uses, one, one version says, don't heap up empty phrases. Don't just repeat for the sake of repeating. And, and then he gives, the, he gives this instruction on how to pray. And You know, Monica, last week, she gave the, she gave the scripture that says, pray without ceasing. And... That's an interesting thing to do because most of us want to take some time to eat or something during the day. But, you know, how can we do that? How can we pray without ceasing? How can we pray continuous, continuously? Well, I think it, it really starts with the understanding that prayer is more than words. Prayer is life. Prayer is something that it's... Prayer is the way that we relate to God and we relate to one another. It's, it's all wrapped up into this thing called prayer. And Jesus didn't really give us so much a prayer to recite as a, converse, as, a, as a conversation to start with God. It was a conversation to begin with him. And it wasn't meant to be complicated. It was actually meant to be something that was really simple. It was meant, it was, it was instructions that were given to guys that were, were fishermen it was instructions that were given to guys who were, you know, laborers for a living. It, it, it wasn't, comp these were not educated men that were, that Jesus was teaching a complicated formula to. These were just regular people that, that wanted to know how to talk to God. And so he starts by the way you start many conversations, by addressing who you're talking to. What's really interesting is Jesus right here does one of the most revolutionary things that you probably could do in this society at this time. And he, he says, the first thing that you say, we all know the first two words of the prayer, our Father. And we don't think much of that because most of us have grown up with the prayer and we've said it our whole lives. But when he did this, he did a couple of things. One... He, when he said Father, he said our Father, he used the Aramaic word for Father, which is Abba. Now, every Hebrew boy would have grown up praying prayers in Hebrew because that was the language that you prayed in. It's still the language that, that Jewish people pray in. It's, they, they start, 
that just for Jesus to start by changing the language of prayer from Hebrew to Aramaic was basically, you know, he, was, he was making the statement that when you talk to God, talk in your own language. Talk the way you would normally talk. If you're going to go out for coffee with someone, talk to God the same way that you would talk to them over coffee. Some of you are thinking, I don't know if I should talk to God like this. <laughs> in other words, be real. Speak your own language to God. Don't, you don't need to kick into King James. You don't need to dig up an American accent for God to hear you. Thus says the Lord. It doesn't, doesn't do anything. It doesn't make any difference. He was talking about that, that when, you, when you talk to God, talk in a language that you're comfortable with. And right from the start, he personalizes prayer. He, he says, our father, or what, what in, the, in the language was Abba, which is not actually a formal term of address at all. It's actually a very informal term. It's the same way that it would be probably more accurate to translate it like daddy. It's, 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 it's an informal term of address. And what was, what was he doing by, by doing that? He wasn't, he wasn't trying to belittle um, he wasn't trying to belittle God. What he was trying to do in here is to realize that, that you have a relationship with God that's not at a distance. You know, it used to be that they would, they would start off prayers with, with a formal title of address to the God of Abraham, to the God of Isaac, to the God of Jacob. That was how prayers began. And he just says, just say Papa. That's, that's mind-blowing. This is actually borderline heresy in this time. This, this, this alone could, could get Jesus into trouble, but you know he did a lot of other stuff too that got him into trouble <laughs> with the religious folk. But just to, so you can understand, get, see, kind of see the gravity of when, when it came down to how, uh, when it came down to how Jews, and especially in this, this day and age, how they viewed uh, the holiness of God and the name of God, in particular, the name of God. When, when a Jewish scribe, when they were copying out the Old Testament or the, the, the Torah, they would, every time they came to the name of God, Yahweh, they would set the pen that they were using aside, they would pick up a brand new pen, they would write the name Yahweh, and then that pen would be set aside never to be used again because it had written the holy name of God. So for, for Jesus to say, just say Papa, it's like, I don't know if I can do that. <clears throat> He's trying to bring them into a place where, where, where it's approach as you would your own parent. Approach as you would a family member. Jesus, he didn't, he didn't tell us to come like a beggar from the outside but come as a family member, a son or a daughter that's loved. And, and I think the, the big thing here is just to realize we've been invited to, uh, you know, prayer is an invitation to a relationship. This prayer was given as an invitation to a conversation with God, not, not given as a religious duty to fulfill. It was given as something to be a part of the conversation of our life. Then he says, your kingdom come, your will be done. Now, kingdom come is a really interesting concept because a lot of times when it, when it comes to, you know, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, we think, well, that'll be one day, you know, one day in heaven, one day the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. You know, if we're good, if we say all our prayers properly, if we've accepted Jesus, then one day we get to go to the kingdom of heaven. That's not what the kingdom of, of God is. The, the kingdom of God is actually here now, today. Jesus said that the kingdom of God is among you. And, and this is, this is, what is the, what's a kingdom? Well, a kingdom is the dom domain of a king. That's what a kingdom is. And we don't, we don't really use the term kingdom anymore in, in, in our modern day vernacular. But a kingdom is where a king reigns. And so, 
when we, it implies a system of government, it implies, you know, certain uh, traditions, it implies certain systems of order, certain attitudes, and, uh, it, you know, don't make the mistake of thinking this is talking about something way far away. This is, this is a prayer about today. And this is a prayer to say, let your kingdom or your domain come to my experience or my life, to the life of the people that I interact with, to my community, to my country. Let your kingdom come. Let your system of living. And, you know, the, the, you know it's... You know, the kingdom of God, it's not a, it's not a political party. Right. Sorry, conservatives. <laughs> it's not. It's not a political party. It's not, it's not it, you know, Jesus was not a conservative. Right. <laughs> he wasn't a liberal either. Right. Or an NDP. Sorry. <laughs> When Jesus showed up on the scene, whenever you see in the Old Testament, there's this thing called the angel of the Lord. That's actually Jesus in disguise. And he's showing up in shiny clothing. And so whenever he would show up, people would ask questions like, whose side are you on? It's like, like I got a shiny guy on my side. This is a good thing. You know, somebody who stands like eight feet tall and wields a blazing sword. Good guy to have in your army, isn't it? Yeah. So they'd ask, whose side are you on? And it's just like, I am a side. Like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you can be on my side if you want, but I don't join sides. And that's the way the kingdom of heaven is. It's like, we don't, we don't ask God to support our agenda. It's like, we want, we want our lives to line up into his system. And so, it, it's, you know, the, that every day we have, to, we have to make that decision. Am I going to... Uh, believe for God's kingdom in my life and His His order and His right order and you know the 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 kingdom of God. It's not it's not prosperity. It's not it's not the house you live in. It's not the vehicle you drive. the The kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is we find it in Romans. It's it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And you know what's righteousness? That's a great word that we actually don't really know what it means very well anymore. Righteousness is when there's rightness or right order in our life. When a life is well-ordered, or there's, there's right order to it, that's righteousness. It's rightness is the, is the root of the word. And, and it's, we're, we're praying for God's rightness to be established in our life. Because, you know, we all know when things aren't, aren't right. The stuff in our own life, maybe emotionally, maybe physically, maybe spiritually, we, we've all gone through experiences where we know something is out of order. Well, that's what this part of the prayer is about. God, bring your rightness to my life so that I experience peace, I experience joy, I experience your favor in my life. And uh, we're, you know, the, we're, I've got so much going through my head right now. I just need to figure out how to do like four sentences at a time. So what this prayer is at this part, your kingdom come, your will be done. This is actually an invitation for God to change us. This is an invitation for him to come and change our hearts, to change our lives, and to bring his order to our lives. All right, let me keep going here. Give us this day our, give us this day our daily bread. This is, and this is a really simple prayer. What are we praying for when we pray that? Provision. Yeah, we're praying for provision. That's exactly what we're praying for. We're praying that God will provide. And, and uh, the way the, this reads like this, our daily bread, it, it actually it kind of sounds like just pray for just enough for today. But uh, it, it's, one scholar wrote that in, uh, to a more accurate translation. I'm getting stuck here. A more accurate, tra accurate translation of this portion of the scripture would actually be more accurate to read, give us the bread that is without ceasing. Give us the bread that's without ceasing. In other words, not just provision so that I can eat a sandwich today, but provision so that there's many sandwiches provided in the, it, it, it's a continual, it's a flow of provision. So this is, this, is a great, this is a great prayer for a business owner. This is a great prayer, you know, as a, as a wage earner. It's praying for the bread that continuous, continuously uh, arrives, uh, the bread that's without 
ceasing. This is asking God to lead us in, you know, if you're in business, it's asking him to lead us in our business ventures, in our investments, and in what we pour our time and our energy into. It's uh, for, our, for our careers, whatever that might be. Give us this day our daily bread. It's really interesting. That word there for our is plural. Give us this day our daily bread. So in other words, and you know, as a business owner, I understand this. Because when I pray, I'm not praying for me. I'm praying for everybody that works for me. I'm praying for everybody that, that, that earns a wage working in, for my company. Sometimes those people are direct employees. But you know what? Sometimes those are other sub-trades. Sometimes those are other contractors other people. I'm, I'm praying that God will have that unceasing flow of provision that will continually come to all of us. It's, it's corporate. And so there's, there's this understanding that in this verse, as we pray, we're praying together. We're praying together. We're not just praying, Lord, I pray that I just get filthy rich. Good for you, you selfish bastard. Like it's... <laughs> Did I say that out loud? Because that prayer would be, give me today my daily bread, but don't worry about anybody else. Oh, Mike, you're sounding maybe not so capitalist. You know, the Bible promotes capitalism. You know, it also promotes communism. What? <laughs> it does. Because there's not a political system that fits into the kingdom of God. And in certain situ in the in the book of Acts, when the church was born, it said they took everything they had and they all put it in common and distributed it as all had need. Why were they doing that? Because multiple people were dying in poverty. It was the situation they were in. They were oppressed by the Romans. They couldn't work. If you were sick, you couldn't, you couldn't work. If you were just Jewish, you might not get food. So people put all their provision. But then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, a short time later, we find a group... Uh, a group of people that Paul had to address and tell the church, stop feeding these turkeys. Yes. He did. It's, a, it's a, actually really funny. He, he said, stop feeding these guys. It, it was a group of young men who that they were living off of this charity of the church where they, you know, they, people would hold their, their lots in common. And these guys, and Paul said, if these guys don't show up to work, don't let them eat. So where does that fit in the... The problem or the problem with any political system or any system that you ideology is that the problem is the human heart. Is that the corrupt human heart will always seek to take advantage of any system and the redeemed human heart will make any system work. That's that's the difference. And that's so when we're praying for God's kingdom, we're not praying we're not praying for a political system. We're praying for God's order in our hearts. Oh, where am I now? <laughs> forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This is interesting. Uh, if you read this in multiple uh, versions, that this word debts, some translate it sins, some translate it trespasses. There's different words because we don't have an English word that actually describes it accurately. But it's uh, uh, the most accurate way to do it uh, to to describe this is that um, it's, it's basically a, a, a state of allowing us to offer grace to those around us, expecting grace to be given back to us. That, and and, and it's, it's basically, it's a prayer saying, don't let my shortcomings be my downfall. Don't let where I've, the, the word debts or trespasses or sins, it's actually most accurate to just say where I have failed to do what is right. It's a failure to act or a failure. It's not really so much as a, a violation of somebody else, but the failure to actually act properly. 
to do what's right. How many fall into that category? It's like, you know, where you just like, oh, if I could just go back and do that again. The, the, the failure, and, and it's praying that that failure to act correctly won't be held against us as well. So we, we don't hold other sh- others' shortcomings against them, and they don't hold them against us. And that's actually the only place that healthy community can thrive, yeah. is where we don't hold each other, you know, the, the, where, where we nitpick and, and, and tear apart. And yeah. I could say so much about that, but there's, it, it, it's, it's an attitude of, of, uh, of grace and forgiveness towards the people that we interact with on a daily basis or, or, or even a casual basis. Um, you know, some people say, well, what about those who just do us wrong? Are we supposed to forgive them too? Are we supposed to, what about the people who just outright sin or, or continue to do wrong and don't want to change? Well, see, the thing is, you don't have to, you don't have to hate to be able to fight for what's right. You can still love and, and still fight for what's right. And in fact, I, I believe that the Bible teaches that through, through forgiveness, our fight for what's right is actually purified. So what we fight for is something that's pure and not just out of anger or vengeance, but that, but that it, it becomes something that's pure and wholesome that brings life. Don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from evil. That word temptation is the same word that's used in the Bible for trials. Don't let us yield to trials. Don't let us yield in times of trials. Jesus told Peter, watch and pray that you don't fall into temptation. It's interesting that once you, if you put the word trial in there, the, the meaning of that becomes so much more clear. You know, watch and pray so that you don't falter in times of trial, that you don't give up in times of trial. And Jesus told us, he says, in this world, there's going to be trouble. In this world, you'll go through trials. Don't pray for God to, that you don't get any trouble. Pray to God that you don't fail in the trouble, that, you're, that your strength doesn't run out in the trouble. Talk to God about your trials. You know, Jesus told Peter, he says, Peter, Satan has requested to sift you like wheat. It's not the kind of thing you want to hear. It's like, Jesus, big guy on the scene. Satan, man, that's another big guy on the scene. Sift me like wheat. Shoot. (laughs) But Jesus said, I've prayed for you that your faith would not fail. He didn't say that I prayed for you that you'll get out of the trial, but that you, through prayer you receive strength through the tri- through the trial. And you know this is this is really about um, this this prayer here is really looking to who is who are we going to look to to guide us through tough times? Who are we going to look to to guide us through the trials through the through the through the difficulty? And uh, what's interesting is, you know, if you've ever been on a trip maybe to a foreign country where you don't speak the language, when you get there and you have to go somewhere, you really need a guide. You need somebody that can show you how to get where you want to go. And years ago, I went on a missions trip to Kazakhstan, and we got rerouted to another city that, uh, that was about four hours away from the city we were supposed to get in. And so we arrived there. We have... There's a group of us, and we have one translator. And he's from Moscow. He's not even from Kazakhstan. He's never been there before. He doesn't even know where we're going. And just to give you perspective on size, that would be like, you know, there, Kazakhstan is as far from, from Moscow is, is like Florida is from here. Like it's, and it get, it's a totally different place. And... We arrived there, and it's, well, what do we do? How do we get to where we're going to go? And they say, well, let's look for a taxi and ask who knows how to get there. And after quizzing a few taxi drivers, a couple guys finally say, yeah, we know how to get there. And they had us going through fields. 
at one point, it's like I woke up in the middle of the ride. It's like, bang, bang, bang. It's like, where are we? We've been traveling for 40 hours already. Where are we? And the others in the van, it's like, we are on a train trestle bridge over top of a canyon right now. And I'm just like, Jesus, I'm going to die. I'm going to (laughs) die. Do you know what? These guys got us there. They got us on a journey I never could have made. I would still be in Kazakhstan wandering around the countryside. They got us there. And, you know, that's the thing. Jesus is the guy that will get us there. Let me just, I, people, people often ask me, how does, I don't know how to hear God. They'll, they'll make the comment, I don't know how to hear God speak to me. How does God speak to me? I just want to just kind of throw this in there because I believe that, 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 that hearing God speak is a very important part of prayer. But when I say hearing God speak, I, like, there's no audible voice that speaks. This is, this is how I believe we can know what Jesus is saying to us. We open our Bible and we start at Matthew chapter 1 and start until you start hitting red letters. And that's what Jesus is saying. And that's the purest form of God's interaction with mankind that has ever happened and ever will happen. That's, that's it, right there. And, you know, it says that, it says faith comes by hearing and hearing comes through the word of God. You know, faith comes through the word of God. The the guidance comes through the word of God. And I want to just kind of leave you with a challenge here um, today as a church is that take the voices of your past and set them aside. Take the voices of Fox News Network and set it aside. Take the voices of CBC or whoever you're... Take a media, take a social media break and just open up the Gospels and just read what Jesus says for yourself and let that form your faith. I heard a terrible stat that most most Christians don't read their Bible, but they form their theology based on, on conservative news networks. It's like, come on. It's like, it's in red. It's even made easy for us. It's like, (laughs) look at the red stuff. Read it. You can highlight it too. It's okay. You know, that's, that will challenge your thinking more than anything. That will guide and direct it. And you say, how does God speak? This is how he speaks to me. I hit something and I go, huh. It's interesting. I've never read it like that before. Never noticed that before. And I just read it. Might write it down. Might just make note of it. You know, one of the things that happened, reading the book of Proverbs. This is in the midst of our, our, of all the terrible things going on in the world today. I came across this one that just caused me to stop and pause. Proverbs 25, 23, it says, if your enemy's hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he's thirsty, give him water to drink. I thought, hmm, it doesn't really go along with bomb the hell out of him, but (laughs) 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 I'm not, I'm not going to give a message on that. All I'm saying is that the word of God, when you read it, should challenge you. And that's how, that's how God's system will come to your life. His kingdom, his order, his reign, it comes through his word. And quantity isn't necessarily great. Sometimes you just need one verse that challenges you. You don't need, you don't need a ton. Let's stand up. I've blabbermouthed my way out of time. I want to, I do want to, I've given all of you your challenge. That's just read red letters for a while. But, you know, maybe... Maybe you're here and you've never actually said yes to following Jesus and, and you're thinking, you know what, I'd like, to, I'd like to take this step on my journey and say yes to him. Let's just bow our heads. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And if you want to say yes to him, you can just join us as we pray. Let's pray together. Jesus, I say yes to you. 
I want to follow you. I want to follow your plan and your purpose for my life. I want to have your order. I want to have your rightness in my life. I say yes to you. Would you come in my life? Forgive me of my sin. and Give me a new start. In Jesus' name.